Hello and welcome. I am Joel Gelfand, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled Navigating a New Psoriasis Guidelines, Implications for Clinical Practice. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider for continuing education for clinicians worldwide. Today's CME CE activity is also eligible for American Board of Internal Medicine MOC points. Once you've completed today's program, submit your completed paperwork to CME Outfitters, and they will submit your MOC points. You can also visit the CME Outfitters Dermatology Hub for a list of resources for both clinicians and patients, and the CMEO team is continually updating the, this hub, so stop back often. As is timely in these challenging times, we will also be discussing the management of patients with psoriasis during the current uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The goal of today's activity is to enable our learners to apply the guidelines in clinical practice with regard to the selection of biologic therapy, management of comorbidities, and the treatment of pediatric patients. And I do want to say a special thank you to my colleagues at CME Outfitters for arranging this program on such short notice. Uh, traditionally, we would be in the studio uh, all together doing this work, and, and literally within a, a span of a week, uh, we repurposed this to a, a web-based program where all the faculty and all those who bring this work to you are, are uh, separated uh, in their own homes uh, to try to minimize risk of COVID-19 infections. Okay, so again, I'm Joel Gelfand. I'm a professor of dermatology and epidemiology uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I want to introduce my faculty today. Uh, with me is Dr. Annalisa Halpern, who's a very busy uh, general dermatologist uh, in New Jersey. She's also associate, program, associate professor of medicine and director of the dermatology residency program at the Cooper uh, Medical School of Rowan University. Welcome, Anna. Thank you, Joel. I'm happy to be here. And I also want to introduce Dr. Lara Wine Lee, who's a renowned pediatric dermatologist and has a real important perspective to share for the new guidelines. For the first time, we have guidelines in pediatric psoriasis. Uh, Lara is an assistant professor of dermatology and pediatrics at the Medical University of South Carolina in, in uh, Charleston. Welcome, Lara. Thank you very much, Joel. And so thank you both for joining me today remotely. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an unprecedented time for all of us. Uh, and for those of you who have taken time out of your busy schedules to be with us, I thank you. Uh, and for those of you listening remotely, uh, we also uh, appreciate your attention to these matters and keeping up with your education during these rapidly changing times. Uh, again, the title of our program is Navigating the New Psoriasis Guidelines, Implications for Clinical Practice. Uh, this is a rapidly changing uh, environment for us in psoriasis and we will give you up-to-date information. Let me now review our learning objectives. The first learning objective is to integrate biologic therapy into treatment plans for appropriate patients with moderate to severe psoriasis in accordance with the joint AAD National Psoriasis Foundation guidelines. Our second learning objective is to implement these strategies and manage comorbidities in patients with psoriasis as recommended by the Joint American Academy of Dermatology uh, and National Psoriasis Foundation guidelines. And our third objective is to apply these joint guidelines uh, when managing pediatric patients with psoriasis. We will be integrating each of these objectives as we discuss the various real world patient cases today. Now, I want to jump right in here and address some of the uh, uh, issues around COVID-19, uh, which is truly a global pandemic uh, affecting so many people uh, around the world. And I want to review some key facts and figures with you to make sure we're all on the same page about uh, how we're thinking about the current state of affairs and how we communicate information to our patients about it, who really need to turn to us uh, for re reliable information. Okay, so the first thing we need to know about is that COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus, of which there are hundreds of coronaviruses. Uh, this virus, uh, they typically circulate amongst animals, pigs, camels, bats, and cats. Uh, and sometimes they could jump to humans, as occurred in the SARS outbreak of 2002 to 2004, or the MERS outbreak, which occurred in 2012. Uh, COVID-19 is really a syndrome, and it's caused by the virus called SARS-CoV-2. It is spread by respiratory droplets, uh, and that's why uh, social distancing, staying six weeks away, six uh, feet away from other people is so important because when we cough, respiratory droplets travel about six feet. Uh, these respiratory droplets can be uh, viable on, on hard surfaces for up to 72 hours, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, regular cleaning of, of, of potentially contaminated surfaces uh, is important to helping stop the spread of the virus. 
And of course, when we touch these surfaces or someone coughs and we shake their hand, for example, uh, and we touch our mouth or our nose or our eyes, that is how the virus uh, spreads from person to person. Uh, much of what we know about the epidemiology of disease has come out of large studies out of China, uh, with fairly similar results being seen around the world, with some exceptions, of course. Uh, when patients come to the emergency room for evaluation, so that these are the ones who are sick enough, because we know for probably 85% of people with this disease, it's pretty mild, maybe even borderline subclinical. Um, and so for those who are sick enough to seek medical attention, 44% <clears throat> have fever admission, 68% have a cough, and gastroenterology intestinal symptoms are pretty uncommon. <clears throat> to date, rash has not really been reported, although very recently there's emerging reports in the JAD uh, coming out of uh, Thailand uh, of a patient who had a rash that sort of resembled the rash seen in dengue fever. So stay tuned. Uh, there may be some patients who have a rash, but it's certainly not characteristic of how these patients present. Now, a very common finding in patients who are affected uh, is lymphocytopenia, which occurs in 83% of patients. Uh, and Increased C-reactive protein is seen in 61% of patients. So the body has a pretty strong immunologic response to this virus. As I mentioned earlier, most people will have pretty mild disease, but in 15%, their symptoms will be severe. 5% require intensive care unit, uh, and about 1.4% of patients uh, have died in this study at uh, China. And, and those are mimicking sort of uh, where the numbers tend to be uh, in the U.S. currently. The incubation period is an average of five days, ranging from two days to 11 and a half days. And this is the rationale behind when someone's been exposed uh, to COVID-19 patients, uh, that we ask them to then self-quarantine for a period of 14 days, because it is uh, mathematically very unlikely that someone will be exposed on day zero, have no symptoms whatsoever for 14 days, and then be shedding the virus. That's based on the best data we have uh, to date. Let's talk about the pathophysiology uh, of this disease. So the way SARS-CoV-2 works is that it gets into the cells through the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, the ACE2 receptor, which we know is so important uh, for management of hypertension. Uh, it spreads mainly throughout the respiratory tract. Uh, the severe outcomes in the lungs tend to be acute respiratory distress syndrome, as well as cytokine storm. And a number of cytokines that are familiar to us as dermatologists tend to be elevated in people uh, suffering with uh, COVID-2 infections. Uh, this includes interleukin-4 and 13. Uh, these are cytokines, for example, that are elevated in atopic dermatitis and are treated by a drug called dupilumab. Uh, IL-12, IL-17, and TNF-alpha are all things that are elevated in patients with COVID-2 infections. And interestingly enough, are, are all targeted by some of the biologics we use for people with psoriasis. So what's the thing about what therapeutics are being studied? And it's important to emphasize that currently there are no proven therapies uh, for, um, for COVID-2 infection. Uh, everything at this point is purely either speculative or experimental, uh, and there is no vaccine currently. So uh, we recently looked at the studies ongoing in the U.S. This is from uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, looked up uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, and you'll see things like Losartan are being uh, studied. Uh, perhaps that will interfere with the virus uh, and entering cells, giving its effects on uh, the ACE receptor. Uh, immune modulators are being studied, uh, uh, analog of basal active intestinal peptide, uh, antiviral therapies such as remdesivir, uh, biologics that target IL-6, uh, trying to block this cytokine storm we see in people with pulmonary disease, and vaccines are in phase one uh, clinical trials. Now, I will highlight uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I'll just use a brand name, pl uh, Plaquenil, that people are familiar with. It's been around for many, many years. <clears throat> and this study has gotten a lot of buzz in the way media uh, and in press conferences out there. And I, I want to make sure we're aware of the degree of, of rigor or, or lack of rigor that's behind these findings. So uh, this was a study, an open-label uh, trial uh, out of France, um, no placebo group, no randomization, just sort of a concurrent group that was used as control. Uh, they had 26 patients who received uh, Plaquenil, and six of these patients who were in the study getting this drug were dropped from the analysis. Three who got sicker and had to go to the ICU, one who got sicker and died, one who stopped therapy due to nausea, and one who left the hospital on their own uh, recognizance. Uh, during the days uh, that went forward in the study, six patients had azithromycin added at the discretion of, of the physicians in the study. 
They had 16 controls. These were patients who either refused Plaquenil, uh, did not meet criteria for the study, or were from other centers. And what drew the buzz is that uh, a virologic cure, meaning that they would swab the patient's uh, respiratory tract, their nares, and look for PCR or culture. And they would show that 70% of people who got Plaquenil had a virologic cure, 100% of those who got Plaquenil plus these extra six people who got azithromycin had virologic cure versus only 12.5% of the patients who were the control group. So I think we could conclude from this data that it's sort of intriguing, uh, but it's a very weak clinical trial design. There's no randomization, there's no blinding, there's no real uh, placebo group. Um, it shows a possible improvement in a surrogate endpoint, viral shedding, that has unknown clinical significance at this point in time, and, and clearly no evidence of benefit on clinical outcomes. Uh, three patients in the study were transferred to the ICU, and one died. Uh, representing a substantial mortality rate. And so clearly this is an example of something that needs testing in clinical trials, which are ongoing in the U.S. and elsewhere. And I want to encourage those of you who are listening uh, to this program to not prescribe uh, these therapies uh, for yourself, for your family members, for your patients, uh, because we're already hearing of shortages of some of these drugs, which are critically needed uh, by uh, patients with, say, lupus or other connective tissue diseases uh, to manage their conditions. Now, the AAD has been uh, rapidly moving along with us as well, issuing new guidance as of last week about how to think about the use of biologics in the setting of a sort of unprecedented uh, public health emergency. And so the perspective of the American Academy of Dermatology, which I share, is that we as dermatologists need to delicately balance the risk of immunosuppression with the risk of disease flare requiring urgent medical evaluation. And therefore, patients should not stop biologic therapy without consulting their prescribing uh, clinicians. We think of this as being a stratified way of thinking about it. So for your patients who have risk factors for bad outcomes from COVID-19, uh, older individuals, those with serious cardiopulmonary disease, uh, those are the people you may want to consider delaying the next biologic shot, uh, as well as if they've had a sort of a softer indication for therapy. Some patients may have had milder disease at the time they started, no history of very severe disease that was getting them into uh, trouble with having to go to the emergency room. If they had a milder presentation before, then maybe waiting and to see when the disease comes back uh, and then restarting the biologic at that point in time, assuming we have more information about risk benefit at that point in time is a good strategy. For younger patients, those who are very healthy, those who have very severe psoriasis, I think many of us advocate for continuing the biologic in that setting, but it is a case-by-case -case basis best discussed uh, by, um, by bringing this up with your patients. Uh, certainly, though, if a patient comes down with symptoms or tests positive for COVID-19, uh, then they should dis discontinue or postpone their biologics until they have recovered. Now, only a few days ago, on March 20th, the AAD provided additional guidance for practice management, uh, where they recommend that dermatologists should avoid all non-essential in-person visits. Uh, patients should be scheduled for non-essential visits or elective services uh, should be transferred over to either telemedicine or rescheduled at a later time when uh, the uh, incidence of community spread uh, has been reduced. Uh, essential, urgent, and high acuity patients uh, still should be treated in the offices by dermatologists. It's uh, necessary for us to try and keep these patients out of the emergency room, which is already uh, heavily overburdened in many areas of the country, and also would be um, uh, a risk for the patient to be exposed to COVID-19. Uh, now, I think the good news about thinking about telemedicine and the management of psoriasis is that there's actually very good cl clinical trial data led by April Armstrong, of which I was a collaborator in this project, where she randomized patients with moderate to severe psoriasis uh, to getting uh, routine in-person care with their dermatologist or remote teledermatology uh, care. And, and what April showed very con convincingly uh, is that the outcomes from the patient perspective are quite similar, whether they are treated in face-to-face -face visits with their dermatologists or through uh, remote uh, telemedicine uh, management. And so in these uh, uncertain times, uh, best for us to manage our psoriasis patients uh, through telemedicine as much as we can, bring them into the office only for the most severe presentations that need uh, urgent evaluation or possibly biopsy. All right, so with that introduction, I want to turn over to Annalisa, uh, who's going to go over our first clinical case for today. Great. Thank you, Joel. And thank you for that excellent review of how we should treat our patients during this time of COVID. So let's go straight to it. Um, our first case is Jane's. 
and he is a 52 year old male. He is 5'10". He weighs 216 pounds. And James was diagnosed with psoriasis when he was 28 years old. And his disease involves his scalp, his trunk, elbows and knees, genitalia, and his fingernails. He describes painful skin and significant pruritus that's developed since he's developed some sleep loss recently with that. He is severely embarrassed by his disease. Um, and he was under relatively good control uh, until about three to six months ago when he developed swelling in his hands and feet and some back pain um, and some early morning stiffness. In the past, he had been treated with, treated with acetretin, but that was discontinued when he developed his psoriatic arthritis. He was using sulfasalazine for a while until he developed a rash. And then he was on methotrexate, which was discontinued due to elevated liver function tests. Currently, and for the past two and a half years, he's been on adalimumab, 40 milligrams every two weeks, and he also uses an inhaler as needed. His family history is significant for a father with psoriasis, a mother with diabetes and hypertension, and a brother with Crohn's disease. So James is obese with a BMI of 31, and he's had psoriatic arthritis for about 20 years. He also has hypertension and asthma. And when he comes in the office today, he has a blood pressure of 160 over 90. And you note that he has a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3%. So on exam, you see that James has a global assessment of three, which is moderate psoriasis, and his body surface area is 12%. And as noted, his disease mainly affects his scalp, his chest, his elbows, his knees, and his genitalia. He does have also some pitting and onycholysis in his fingernails. And you note he has tender and swollen metacarpal, metatarsal, and PIP joints. And you also see that he has diffuse swelling of his third toe. But some other additional considerations in his case is he has a very demanding job with long hours and for work has a photo shoot in one month coming up. So at this point, I wanna let the audience get involved and you're gonna see on your screen the question and you can vote now. Joel, are there data in the new guidelines um, to support the option of actually increasing the dose of the TNF inhibitor at this point? Yeah, so Annalisa, thank you uh, for that question. You know, the guidelines are quite comprehensive, summarizing, you know, years of work in psoriasis. And what we want to do today is just, is just point out some of the pearls that will help clinicians practice more individually uh, when taking care of patients. So one of the issues we know as physicians is that biologics tend to lose response over time. Uh, but there's good evidence, uh, often level A evidence, <clears throat> that increasing the dose of a biologic can help recapture uh, the outcome we're trying to achieve for our patients. So yeah, these uh, joint AAD the MPF guidelines speak to that, uh, increasing the dose of a Tanercept to, to twice weekly if necessary, uh, increasing the dose of adalimumab from once every two weeks to once a week. And for James, that might be a real consideration because it seems like he's losing response. Maybe increasing his dose to once weekly would be helpful. Or infliximab, we will dose that from every eight weeks up to every four weeks and up to every and up to 10 mg per kilogram from the standard dose, which is five mg per kilogram. And that's really important to know for clinical practice because oftentimes they're trying to make a drug work as long as possible before having to switch to another therapy. This information is often very useful when uh, conveying the need to switch uh, the uh, dosing regimens uh, to the payer. Now, also relevant uh, to our case is James's uh, arthritis symptoms, uh, and the issue some joint guidance along the lines of the AAD uh, and MPF, which is really to uh, educate patients about psoriatic arthritis in this disease state. And I think it's important for patients to be aware of what to look out for, uh, because over the years, I've had many patients uh, who have presented with things like dactylitis uh, and got the wrong diagnosis from their other physicians, because we have to recognize psoriatic arthritis is an uncommon uh, disease in a broader population, but very common in the setting of people with psoriasis. So, so we as uh, people taking care of this disease are often more expert uh, than other physicians may be. And it is important to feel comfortable managing and identifying this, this disease in our patients. Now, how do you screen for psoriatic arthritis? Well, it really starts with a good history. You want to ask the patient about signs of inflammatory arthritis, which basically means morning joint stiffness and tenderness or pain. Uh, and typically, it's lasting between 20 and 30 minutes or more. 
Uh, most commonly, the small digits of the hands and feet are affected, uh, but you could have uh, an Achilles tendonitis. You could have uh, hips, knees, elbows, uh, neck involved. Uh, spine, of course, is a, a, a spondylitis-like presentation as well. And so you really have to be on the work at, lookout uh, for the various um, uh, manifestations of this disease. Now, when you're examining a patient, it's pretty easy to do a, a brief exam of the small joints of the hands, the MCPs, the DIPs, the PIPs. And what you basically want to do is you want to press on these small joints uh, hard enough for, that with your thumb, such as the top third of it becomes white. Uh, that's the right amount of pressure to put on uh, a, a small PIP or DIP or MCP joint to elicit tenderness in someone with inflammatory bowel uh, inflammatory joint disease, I should say. And the patient usually won't uh, say anything uh, or, or say ouch. Usually they will uh, either wince or pull back a little bit. So it's important to maint maintain eye contact and get a sense of if, the, if you're causing discomfort for that patient. Now, for a lot of my patients, they may have reluctance to go see another doctor. They may not want to see a rheumatologist or they may have trouble getting in with a rheumatologist. And so I may consider doing additional objective workups if necessary. Uh, this will include x-rays of the hands and feet if they're affected uh, because you can find um, uh, joint damage uh, in, these, in these areas with x-rays, um, erosions, things of that nature. Uh, and that's critical to find because if you do see that, that's a real marker that the patient's at risk for uh, a, a mutilating version of this disease that could be progressive. And then you really want to say to the patient, you need to be on disease-modifying therapy and you, you should see a rheumatologist. Uh, I'll also do a lab workup on some of these patients. I'll look for markers of inflammation. Uh, when CRPs are elevated, that is predictive of uh, having progressive joint damage. Uh, and so if it's elevated, uh, that uh, adds some, um, some uh, urgency for the patient to be treated as well as to see rheumatology. Uh, if it's normal, though, don't be too reassured because it's not a great biome marker and people can have psoriatic arthritis and normal CRPs. Uric acid can be elevated and gout. Gout can behave a lot like psoriatic arthritis. And then sometimes people with symmetric uh, joint involvement, uh, they can really be masquerading uh, having truly rheumatoid uh, arthritis. And I've picked up two or three cases in my career of people felt to have PSA, but they really had rheumatoid arthritis. And we do this by checking a rheumatoid factor and a CCP antibody. Uh, and if these are positive, of course, they, they need to be managed by rheumatology. Now, Annalisa, you also know that James has a history of hypertension. Uh, his A1C is in the pre-diabetes range. <clears throat> He's also overweight. He's obese. Uh, and so the AAD and MPF have recognized uh, the, the dramatic increase in our knowledge of comorbidity and psoriasis over the last decade and, and how we have for the first time got on specifically uh, towards these issues. And so one of the most important comorbidities beyond psoriatic arthritis is cardiovascular disease in these patients. Uh, and so what we guide our clinicians is educate patients about the risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, either screen them according to standard guidelines for blood pressure, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, or help uh, them refer back to their primary doctor for these type of screenings. And then we have a, a risk-based approach. We know from a variety of research, some done by my lab, others by others, uh, that the more severe your psoriasis is, the higher your risk is of having uh, cardiovascular complications. So the body surface area is more than 10%. And in James's case, it's more than 10%. Uh, or if the patient's a candidate for systemic uh, treatment or phototherapy, these are people we want to think about more frequent screening and possibly more aggressive treatment of traditional cardiovascular risk factors. Now, uh, almost simultaneously, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association came out with similar recommendations for preventing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease regarding use of statins. And here, they now label psoriasis as a cardiovascular risk enhancer uh, on the order of, say, rheumatoid arthritis or having HIV disease. And so what that means is that as your primary care doctors, or if you want to do this uh, on your own, it's pretty easy to do using a calculator. <clears throat> when you're calculating a patient's 10-year risk of a major cardiovascular event, that risk is calculated to be 5% or higher. These are people uh, that you want to consider initiating statins and to lower their risk over time. Uh, so uh, so we start them slightly earlier in people with psoriatic disease compared to patients who don't have psoriatic disease. Now, of course, a major question we all have is, does our treatment, or will our treatments lower the risk of cardiovascular events and mortality in our people with psoriasis? 
Well, some data is emerging from the field of cardiovascular medicine, where there's been three major trials done in people uh, at high risk for cardiovascular events. They have established coronary disease. The Cantos trial, a study of canakinumab, uh, interleukin-1 beta biologic inhibitor, that was proof of principle that you can lower the risk of cardiovascular events just by treating inflammation. And then Colcott, a study of colchicine in patients with a recent MI, had similar findings, uh, again, emphasizing that you could use anti-inflammatory therapy in ways that could lower the risk of cardiovascular events. Unfortunately, neither of these treatments are used in the management of psoriasis. The CERT study evaluated methotrexate, which is commonly used in psoriasis and in psoriatic arthritis. And unfortunately, that study had a null finding. There was no impact uh, on cardiovascular events in patients with coronary disease taking methotrexate. Uh, I think the positive side of the study is that the drug was quite safe, uh, even in an older patient population. Uh, and I think one of the big limitations of this study is that there was no criteria for having an elevated CRP at baseline. And so you'll see in a CERT trial, the baseline CRP was basically normal compared to being elevated in Cantos. And so it's possible that methotrexate failed because the patients weren't inflamed. And so perhaps if it was studied in psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis or patients with coronary disease with elevated CRPs, perhaps you would have seen benefit in that setting. Now, we don't have event uh, trials uh, in the field of dermatology because these are studies that involve thousands of patients followed for years. Uh, but what we do have is some rigorous placebo-controlled surrogate market trials uh, that my group has led. Uh, we've done three of these trials now. Uh, the three outputs we look at are aortic vascular inflammation measured by a PET-CT scan, inflammatory markers in the blood that we know are related to cardiovascular disease risk, uh, lipid metabolism, and glucose metabolism. So what did we learn? Well, for aortic vascular inflammation, interestingly, only used to kinumab, an IL-12-23 inhibitor reduced aortic vascular inflammation compared to placebo. That reduction, though, was somewhat temporary and went back to normal, their baseline uh, with further treatment over a period of 52 weeks. When we looked at inflammatory markers, interestingly, uh, adalimumab and phototherapy had the strongest uh, improvements in inflammatory markers known to be causally related to cardiovascular events, including lowering IL-6 and CRP. When it comes to lipid metabolism, only phototherapy improved the profile of our patients by improving HDL particles, the so-called good cholesterol. That's kind of a provocative finding. And when it comes to insulin resistance, glucose metabolism, unfortunately, none of our therapies should benefit uh, on those measures. Now, coming back to our patient, James, he has a history of hypertension. He suffers from psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. A different TNF or an increase in adalimumab may be considered. Alternatively, a change in mechanism of action to an IL-17, which is also quite effective for psoriatic arthritis, might be considered. Here now are the doses we use for biologics, as well as our dosing schedule. Uh, this slide is really for reference, because it's a lot uh, to maintain, and it's a good one to clip out and, and either uh, snap a picture of for your phone or, or keep on your desk so you can be aware of uh, how to prescribe these drugs, what the dosing intervals are, uh, and things of that nature. We also give you data on the half-life of these drugs, and that's helpful as well, because let's say your patient has to undergo a, a high-risk type of surgery, uh, and you want the patient off uh, their biologics. Logic. Well, this will let you know what the half-life is and, and how long they need to be after biologic in order to uh, be assured it's no longer in our system. Or some of my patients travel, they need a live vaccine. This helps me plan when they can get their live vaccine. Now, importantly, <clears throat> a discriminating factor, differentiating factor, if you will, <clears throat> amongst our biologics is efficacy. Uh, and really, POSI 90, uh, which is basically a 90% reduction in psoriasis plaques, and that's equivalent to be pretty close to clear with pretty minimal to no impact on health related quality of life for patients who achieve that endpoint. That's our new gold standard. Now, what I'm showing you here is data from phase three clinical trials. These aren't head-to-head -head studies, but we can learn something from it. And we know from a variety of other studies and meta-analyses that if you want to hit POSI 90, <clears throat> it seems like the IL-17, such as secukinumab, ixikizumab, or bordalumab, or the IL-23 biologics, such as guselkimab or rizinkizumab, are the ones most likely to hit the POSI 90 mark. <clears throat> 
Now, increasingly, we're seeing head-to-head trials, which are really helpful for decision-making as we try and figure out you know, which drug is going to be most useful for most patients over the longer term. Uh, and so uh, you're looking at different endpoints, POSI 75, POSI 90, POSI 100, different time points. I'll just call your attention to the data at week 48. So this is sort of uh, longer-term uh, therapy. And of course, our patients with psoriasis had this disease for decades. They need long-term treatment. And so uh, we are really interested in what happens after a year, two years, three years. But in any event, this 48-week study, guselkimab, clearly more effective than adalimumab and also more effective than secukinumab as well at week 48, uh, suggesting that long-term benefit uh, is better with the IL-23 strategy than these other two drugs. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that the data I'm showing you are from idealized clinical practices that don't necessarily reflect our real-world patients. And, and shown here is what we call a, um, a survival uh, curve or persistence curve of patients staying on therapy. And, and our expectation is that for most patients, they need to be on their psoriasis therapy long-term because we can't cure their disease. When they stop their biologic, eventually the disease will recur. And what we've learned from this type of research so far is that uh, the IL-12-23 uh, mechanism used to kinumab tends to have the best persistence. Uh, we don't have data yet on the new IL-23s that have come to market, but we suspect they'll behave in the same way. Uh, the TNF inhibitors and also um, uh, the uh, IL-17 inhibitors, secukinumab, uh, are ones that people tend to lose response to over time. It is more challenging to analyze these data as new drugs come to market, uh, and so we need more data to fully understand the long-term persistence of therapies like uh, ixtacizumab, secukinumab, uh, and brodalumab. Now, it's important we balance the efficacy data with the risk of side effects. And I would say as, as a class of, of agents, we all know that biologic agents are quite well tolerated. Uh, most patients really have no side effects from these therapies and do quite well from a safety point of view. That being said, there are uncommon things you have to be aware of and counsel patients about. So for the TNF class of drugs, we know that, that they are associated with demyelinization and potentially uh, initiation or, or aggravation of congestive heart failure, certainly quite rare phenomenon to see. Um, they also carry black box warnings for serious infections and malignancies and patients need to be educated and informed about these potential uh, concerns. Now, uh, for our newer therapies, the IL-17s and, and the uh, 23s, <clears throat> we note that a differentiating factor uh, for IL-17s is a small risk of inflammatory bowel disease. You know, initially it was felt that these therapies would help uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and the trials really didn't show that. They suggested that if anything, maybe they made it a little bit worse. Uh, and there have been some spontaneous reports, uh, roughly one in a few thousand patients uh, developing inflammatory bowel-like disease on uh, the IL-17 therapy. So it's, it's a low risk risk, but one you want to be thinking about, especially if the patient has an underlying risk for uh, Crohn's disease or has Crohn's disease. Uh, you should know that the IL-17s uh, are also associated with uh, candidal infections. You can see that in the 23s. That's kind of a class effect because uh, IL-17 is very important for mucosal immunity and particularly for managing candida infections. Now, these are usually pretty, um, uh, pretty benign, easy to manage with either over-the-counter medications or, or oral diflucan if necessary. Uh, usually people don't stop the medication for that. And then finally, brodalumab, uh, which is a receptor blocker of IL-17, it carries a black box warning of suicidal ideation and behavior. And therefore, if you're going to use this drug, uh, you need to uh, prescribe it in the setting of a REMS program. Now, this next slide is really a summary of how you can think about different comorbidities and how it may influence your decision making. So it's a chart, again, that you can cut out and use for reference in your clinical practice. But let's just come back to James. You know, he has psoriatic arthritis. So we go to the psoriatic arthritis uh, column here. And from this information, usually, usually TNF inhibitors are the gold standard, uh, especially according to ACR guidelines, American College of Rheumatology. Uh, but increasingly, we have head to head data of, of IL 17s like ixekizumab compared to. Um, uh, adalimumab, showing fairly equivalent responses in the joints, but better responses in the skin. And, and so many of us now think of IL-17s as fairly equivalent uh, drugs in, this, in the joints for people with psoriatic arthritis, and, and, but certainly better uh, in the skin. So IL-17 is often thought of as a first-line agent for psoriatic arthritis uh, as well. 
Um, so that would be a way to think about this in James's case. Now, the IL-23s are not yet approved for psoriatic arthritis, although data is emerging. And we know with ustekinumab, it has some efficacy in psoriatic arthritis, uh, but no proof that it uh, uh, prevents uh, joint damage uh, and probably has less efficacy than the TNFs. Now, moving back to comorbidity issues, and this bring up James's issue of intolerance to methotrexate. <clears throat> you know, for years, we've thought that methotrexate in patients with psoriasis, they have what we call the psoriatic liver, uh, and that they were more prone to side effects from this agent. And recently, we've, we've tested this hypothesis and, and sort of proved that theory using data from Denmark, working collaboratively with Alexander Egerberg. And what you're looking at is patients in Denmark getting methotrexate for either rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, or psoriatic arthritis. And what you can see clearly is if you have psoriasis, uh, you're much more likely to develop cirrhosis or be hospitalized cirrhosis uh, related to methotrexate treatment compared to those who are already getting methotrexate, controlling for a lot of the different risk factors. So uh, the, our knowledge of how these therapies of, uh, work continues to evolve. All right, so let's come back to the clinical case, James, and, and let me bring it back to Annalisa. Great. Yeah, and that was an excellent review. Thank you so much for going over all that, Joel. Um, so let's try to help the audience at this point translate all of this data back to their clinical practices because it's a lot to digest. Um, so let's talk about James again. And as a reminder, he was on methotrexate but was changed to adalimumab when he developed transaminitis. Um, do recall he has hypertension and psoriatic arthritis. So at this point, let's go back to the audience and the question um, and let's see how this might have changed uh, after all the information that Joel gave us. How would you treat James now? And you can vote now. Wow, okay, interesting results. Um, yeah. Joel, did you want to go ahead and start? Yes, we certainly have a, quite a change uh, pre to post for some of these. Uh, it looks like item four switched to a uh, anti L17. More people uh, shifted in that category. Uh, and a number of people also uh, increased their thinking of, um, of increasing his dosing of adalimumab per the guidelines. Uh, and then people decreased uh, their uh, consideration of adding an IL-23. And I think that probably fits along the lines uh, of the way I think about this case. Uh, Annalisa, you're a busy uh, dermatologist in general practice. Uh, how, how do you think about these data? So I think, you know, one of the things that we can't forget about um, is the fact that his job is demanding and he's got a photo shoot in a month. And I think that when you're talking to patients, they, they really focus on what's on the outside. And so I would try to aim to getting him as clear as he can, as soon as he can, um, while also trying to take care of his joints. I think both those things would probably be the first two parameters that I would try to, to cover. Um, so I think in, in his scenario, you could increase his adalimumab, um, but given the, from the data that you showed in the, one of the earlier slides, that with um, medications such as secukinumab or ixekizumab, um, that you can reach a POSI 90 or a POSI 100 within weeks. Um, so I think given the fact that the IL-17s will help his joints significantly and will also probably get him better faster, that's probably our, where I would start. Yeah, I think that's a great way of thinking about this case. And I think that the, you know, the rapidity of which the IL-17s work is certainly a differentiator for many of our patients. Uh, and you know, his, his losing response to a, IL, uh, to a TNF alpha, certainly if the patient wants to stay on that, that path and feels good about it, that's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but I think switching to an IL-17 would certainly be likely to help improve uh, his skin scores. Why don't we move on to our next uh, case? Um, and this is a patient named Jennifer. Uh, Annalise, you want to talk to us about her? Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Jennifer is a 32-year-old female. She's 5'3". She weighs 170 pounds. And Jennifer has had psoriasis since she was 15 years old. It mainly involves her scalp, but she does have some involvement of her arms and legs and her nails as well. Her itching is mild, but she does say that she's severely embarrassed by her disease. Um, she notes it is better in the summer, um, worse with stress. And Prior treatments really have only been topical preparations. Currently, her only medication is oral sertraline. Um, her family history is significant for a, a grandfather with psoriasis, um, and her father passed away from an MI at age 52. Uh, she also has a brother with Crohn's disease. She does qualify as obese with a BMI of 30, and she has a history of depression. She interestingly has a remote history of developing optic neuritis when she was in college. She smokes about a quarter of a pack of cigarettes daily and has two glasses of wine every night. 
And in the office today, she has a blood pressure of 140 over 90. If you take a look at her and your global assessment is four, so she has moderate to severe disease, but her body surface area is only about 5%. And you note that most of her disease is in fact on her scalp and forehead with a few small patches on her elbows and knees. And then she does have some pitting and onycholysis of her fingernails. So let's go to the audience. Uh, and again, you see the question in front of you and you can vote now. We see that the International Psoriasis Council uh, recently utilized a Delphi exercise to collect and prioritize statements that reflect global expert opinion on the classification of psoriasis severity. And Joel, can you comment on that consensus statement for us? Sure, I'm happy to. And uh, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a member of the board of directors of the IPC, and it was part of uh, crafting this statement or approving it. Uh, and really what we're trying to help clinicians do is think about patients as one of two categories, people who need systemic treatment versus those who don't need systemic treatment. Um, and so um, uh, patients who are, we think are candidates for systemic therapy, and that includes biologics, phototherapy, or pills, uh, they should meet one of the following criteria, have a body surface area more than 10%, or have disease uh, affecting special areas like the, fa the face, palms, soles, genitals, scalp, or nails. So in Jennifer's case, the patient we're talking about today, she has scalp involvement, and that is a criteria in our mind for starting systemic therapy since it's so hard to treat that with, with topical medications. It's also very stigmatizing for patient. And then finally, even uh, people who have localized disease but fail to respond to topical therapy. We have many patients living with psoriasis for years and years, cannot get the disease, the disease under control with topicals alone. And those are individuals that we will consider systemic therapy for uh, if they are bothered by their condition. Now, I think it's important to recognize that despite all the advances we're making in treatment of psoriasis, this remains a highly stigmatizing disease experienced by patients. This is work done by my group, uh, presented at a national meeting recently. Uh, and when you ask patients with psoriasis, what you'll find is that more than a third of them uh, feel that other people think their skin disease is, is contagious. Um, and, uh, this, and they often feel like uh, they're, uh, other people stare at them because of their disease. So a very stigmatizing experience for our patients with the general public. And on the other hand, what's also disconcerting is that many uh, people with psoriasis feel judged by their physician because they have psoriasis. Usually they're talking about their non-dermatologist, their, their primary doctor or other physicians they see. And that's very important for those taking care of psoriasis to recognize that uh, you, you want the patients to feel welcome, that their disease is not contagious, you can touch their skin, uh, things of that nature, and help them uh, feel uh, less stigmatized by what they're dealing with. Uh, you can see that uh, those feelings stigmatized by that dermatologist is quite low. Now, the other issue that's going on is the scalp disease in this patient. Traditionally, we have thought, you know, it's a scalp disease. It's not more than 10% by surface area. Uh, why would you use a systemic agent? Well, <clears throat> we know patients have a lot of burden of disease there. And the guidelines uh, provide really high-level evidence, level A evidence in many cases, of using things like a tanner step of or guselkimab, uh, of using infliximab, adalimumab, secukinumab, or excusimab, uh, or using ustekinumab for the management of these patients. And it's pretty common in my practice to use uh, biologic agents in patients who have tough scalp disease it doesn't respond to topical regimens. Now, there's some other pearls about comorbidities to think about that are relevant to Jennifer's case, uh, alerting us to the common uh, increased rates of anxiety and depression uh, in our patient population, uh, recognizing that a lot of our patients have issues with nicotine or alcohol dependency. And I'll note that Jennifer drinks two drinks a day, uh, which is uh, more than twice uh, what the CDC recommends. Uh, she'll be defined as being a heavy drinker by CDC guidelines. And this is the kind of patient that you want to explore her alcohol use more, maybe do a cage questionnaire with her and see if she tests positive. And a reminder also that uh, patients with psoriasis are more prone to inflammatory bowel disease, often due to shared genetics uh, with uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And therefore, we want to be uh, aware of any GI symptoms they may be having so we can select the right therapies for them. So let's go back to our clinical case now, Annalisa. Great. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to note um, you know, that she's relatively young, Jennifer, she's 32, um, and important, she's getting married in six months, and she's really only used topicals, and as you mentioned, topicals to the scalp are not usually as helpful. Um, so we want to address her psoriasis and her comorbidities, remembering that she did have a history of optic neuritis, but, but always keep in mind that, you know, probably in the forefront of her mind is her wedding in six months. So let's go back to the audience again. And after the data that Joel just shared with you, 
would you change how you were treating Jennifer at this point? And you can vote now. Okay, so uh, some big pre-post-test changes, which I think is really good. So I see uh, for option one, a pre-test, uh, nearly 50% would have said choose a TNF. Uh, post-test, only 22%, and that's really key. A person with a history of optic neuritis, and you do have to specifically ask patients about this. This is a real clinical patient we're talking about from my practice. Uh, you don't want to use TNF inhibitors in those with a history of demyelinization disorders. Um, we saw our increased uh, selections for things like uh, item three, which was uh, an aisle 23 uh, or an aisle 17, and I think uh, as the um, as was noted earlier, uh, you know this is uh, the 17s work quite rapidly, and so this is a patient who's getting ready for a wedding. Uh, oftentimes, we think about aisle 17s in the setting of a wedding. Uh, let me bring Lara into the conversation here. Uh, so, Lara, if this is a pediatric patient, you know, getting ready for prom in six months, uh, how would that influence your thinking of treatment for her? Well, it's exactly the same point um, that I would bring up is that the IL-17s in pediatrics, we do call the PROM drugs. Uh, oftentimes, we don't have a six-month lead-in, but we have even shorter periods of time to really say, how do we get this patient clear? But the other thing I think is really relevant in this case to pediatrics as well is the fact that um, this patient has a high um, quality of life burden and already has some underlying depression. So getting her clear quickly can make a big difference um, in her life. And so I, you know, agree. Uh, that as that as an option if you have it available. If I could ask you a question, Joel, I'm interested to know in your patients with a family history of inflammatory bowel disease and potentially some minor symptoms of it, do you do any screening prior to starting IL-17s? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, actually, let me see if I can shift that question to Annalise because I'm curious what she does in the front lines with this. So in this patient, you know, uh, she has a family history of Crohn's disease. We know IL-17s could potentially increase that risk. Uh, would that enter your decision making? What would you do with this information? Right. Well, I think that it's really important to find out how significant her family history is and ask if there are any other family members that have IBD. Um, but I also think it would be important to follow her closely to see if she develops symptoms. Um, and it's important to find out from her just how much of a concern that is. So if you ask her, you know, your brother has Crohn's disease, does this bother you that this medication may have that as a low but not zero side effect? And if she's relatively concerned about that, then you may need to think about giving her another option. Um, but I think in general, screening patients that have no symptoms with just review of systems is enough at this point. Uh, and I, I sort of agree with that approach, but I think absolutely counseling the patient, make sure they're fully informed and on board with the decision they're making together. That sort of shared decision making is really so key when we're using therapies that patients will be staying on for many, many years in, in many cases. Okay. Well, let's move to our, our third and final case. And Annalisa, why don't you tell us about Melissa? Great. And Lara, this is perfect for you. So now we have a true pediatric patient. Melissa is 12. She's five feet tall and she weighs 160 pounds. And Melissa has had psoriasis since she was an infant. Um, she has involvement of her scalp and her trunk, but also her palms and soles. She is significantly itchy and this is impacting her sleep. Um, currently she is on etanercept at 50 milligrams weekly. Um, she uses a bronchodilator and she has some over-the-counter over hydrocortisone that she uses as needed. Her family history is significant for a father with diabetes, a mother with hypertension and psoriasis, um, but importantly for her, she's getting bullied in school and her peers are calling her names due to her weight and her significant rash. She feels that she has no friends, she's socially isolated, and she has pretty low self-esteem at this point. She's become quite irritable and they're noting some uh, inattentiveness at school as well. So she also qualifies as obese with a BMI of 31 um, and she does have asthma. Her blood pressure in your office is 130 over 89 today. So let's take a look at Melissa and she has a global assessment of four and um, her body surface area is about 18% and you notice scaly erythematous plaques on the trunk, limbs and scalp. And she also has some yellow brown crusting on her palms and soles and some subuncle hyperkeratosis as well. So moving to the viewers again, you will see the polling question on your screen and you can vote now. All right, so Laura, what do the guidelines at this point tell us about management of pediatric psoriasis? Yes, thank you, Annalisa. So 
Earlier this year, the AAD and the NPF published comprehensive guidelines for the care of pediatric patients with psoriasis. I think these guidelines will be very helpful in considering the case here. And the guidelines really remind us first that we have to consider the comorbidities. This is important just for our general health, our well-being, as well as our treatment decisions. So the first comorbidity to consider is psoriatic arthritis. And for Melissa, we actually don't have this information. So we have to just remember that it's important to both educate her and her family about the risk of inflammatory arthritis with cutaneous psoriasis and really in our office screen for signs and symptoms of this with a thorough exam and history. When there is a sign of psoriatic arthritis, we do need to involve our pediatric trained rheumatology colleagues for better management. And I think considering this with your pediatric psoriasis patients is really important because the prevalence of inflammatory arthritis may be less in kids than it is in adults. However, it is not as commonly thought of and therefore could easily be missed. And we really have an early intervention point here to intervene in a very severe disease. When we have the presence of psoriatic arthritis, we also do need to remember to educate and screen for uveitis and make appropriate referrals. So for Melissa as well, we have to consider other comorbidities. You can see from the case presentation that she is um, obese with a BMI over 30 at age 12. This is becoming a more common problem in pediatrics in general. And it is similar to adults that are pediatric psoriasis patients are known to have a higher prevalence of obesity um, relative to unaffected children. The relationship of obesity and pediatric psoriasis may be complex, but there is certainly enough information to suggest that is associated both with disease onset and disease severity. And the screening recommendations here is that all patients at risk starting at age two really need to have a yearly body mass index percentile checked and compared against the normalized charts that are readily available. I think that it's really very important too to understand that this conversation needs to be initiated because many of the caregivers and the education around it just may not be familiar with the association and the importance of addressing these issues head on. It is also important to consider interventions with obesity as lifelong health issues may begin in the pediatric period. And some of those are listed here, which are potentially other cardiovascular risk factors, particularly components of the metabolic syndrome. In some series, it is reported up to 30% of pediatric psoriasis patients may have some of these risk factors. And while it may be less clear than in our adult patients, this exact um, correlation, it's important to note that, again, we have an early intervention period because lifetime health is really set up in our pediatric time period. So education is what is really key. And this is education not just for the patients and their families, but even educations around the primary care providers, because many people are simply not aware of the association in pediatrics to cardiovascular risk factors and the pediatric psoriasis. And so I do think that it is really important in the dermatology office to think about these discussions, provide the education, and to begin to look at the very important screening recommendations that we can aid in. So our guidelines support the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics Screening Recommendations for All Children in terms of cardiovascular risk factors. So very specifically listed here, there's recommendations to screen um, with fasting lipids for the first time between ages nine and 11, and again, between 17 and 21 years of age. So these are recommended in um, the presence of any additional cardiovascular risk factors as well. You may want to consider screening earlier or more frequently. This is minimum screening guidelines. In terms of hypertension, there is recommendation to screen for hypertension in the office starting as early as age three. And again, using age and height reference charts that are easily available. The final recommendation from the AAP in terms of cardiovascular risk factors is in terms of insulin resistance. So when you have psoriasis and obesity present, we have to look at uh, fasting glucose at least every th three years starting at age puberty and again, or at age 10, depending on which is earlier. And I think these are important screening guidelines that may be missed in the primary care offices. And so I oftentimes will consider doing some of these labs if they have not been done, particularly if I'm getting labs for other reasons, such as initiation of systemic therapy. So let's move on to considering how we might manage Melissa or other patients such as her. And so I think this is a really, really useful algorithm to start to think about and a nice one to, to save for your clinical practice. 
So the first uh, part I want to talk about is narrowband UVB. When you have this available and accessible, it is a very reasonable option for kids of most ages. Uh, I oftentimes get questions really, how old does a patient have to be to comply with a phototherapy routine. And truthfully, it really depends on the maturity of the patient. But in our practice, we often have kids as young as age three and four with appropriate guidance and even some test runs before the machine is on, getting them used to it. And they have an excellent outcome with phototherapy. When we have success in the office, there is availability to move this at home. And that can be a really, really successful option for many of our patients. However, when this is not feasible or is not effective, then we do have to think about our systemic options. So we have you know, two major categories here, which are our traditional non-biologics, which are all off-label use for psoriasis in children, although used for many indications in the pediatric population, and our biologic therapy, which we do have some on-label uses for. In general, when I'm initiating systemic therapy, I think it's important just to have a good discussion about our treatment goals and really what the family plans to get out of it. Because in pediatrics, there are some additional considerations such as needle phobia or is lab monitoring going to be a difficult requirement for a younger patient to comply with. So in terms of our non-biologics, we'll talk more specifically about cyclosporin, acetretin, and methotrexate. And our biologics, I just want to point out the on-label uses. So for adalimumab, we have approval for ages four and up for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis um, in the European market and here in the U.S. for arthritis but not cutaneous psoriasis. And a tanercept ages four and up in the U.S. and six in the European market. Used to kinemab is a more recent approval um, for the last few years with ages 12 and up being an on-label indication. So let's look more specifically at our non-biologic medications. And here, when I initiate a systemic therapy, I will initiate it at a safe but effective dose. And this is my kind of general statement for all of these non-biologics. And one of the things that I do like about these medications is I have a good ability then to titrate until desired effect and also potentially dose reduce once I have reached the therapeutic effect that I'm looking for. Method Methotrexate is still our most commonly used systemic medication in the pediatric population, and part of this is due to its um, accessibility as well as its really long-term safety record in even our youngest kids. It's important to note a slower onset of action, so I do like to start a, a safe but on the higher dose range of what is listed here so that you're not really keep titrating up and then getting the patients very frustrated by lack, lack of efficacy early on. The most common side effect that's seen in clinic is GI upset, um, and this can be problem solved with the use of folic acid or moving to subcutaneous injections. Methotrexate is also a medication I really like because it can be used in combination with other treatments, but it is actually pretty easy to give in the pediatric population. So we have a number of dosing preparations that are available to us. So obviously we you know, all are very familiar with the use of the pill, which is a small pill and somewhat easy to, to swallow, but there's uh, liquid formulations as well. So there's a commercially available liquid that's a little bit difficult sometimes to access with insurance. So oftentimes I will use the injectable solution and mix it with something the patient likes to drink and then give that as their oral preparation once a week. And then subcutaneous injection can be used well, particularly if our patients do not have a needle phobia. Cyclosporin is still a really important tool in the pediatric toolbox, and this is mainly due to its easy accessibility and its rapid onset of action. Again, it's generally well tolerated, um, and we do know that children may require higher dosing for similar efficacy in comparison to adults. Again, GI side effects are the predominant ones that I see, and it is available as a liquid and a pill, making it easy for kids of all ages. Acetretin, uh, there is less efficacy and safety data in our younger kids. So out of our teenage population, we do have less data on it, but there is certainly some good use saying that it's safe and effective. An additional challenge with acetretin may be uh, that it's not available commercially in a liquid form, but I have to point out that I really do like this medication because it is our non-immunosuppressive option. So you're dealing with a child that is in the period of time where they're due for their live vaccines. This might be a good consideration for them. <laughs> 
So, however, when we're dealing with our pediatric populations, we really have to think about some of the unattended consequences of our treatments. And this gets a little bit into our safety monitoring, because again, needle phobia and just difficulties with lab draws are very, very common in our kids of all ages, including our teenagers. So that's one of the challenges, for instance, to using cyclosporine for long periods of time, as it may just be difficult for the kids to comply with safety monitoring. In addition with cyclosporin, um, there are the long-term kidney effects that are relevant both to the pediatric population in, and the adults. And so it's important to have this discussion with the families. And I always tell them that if I start cyclosporin, I have not just my plan to start, but I do have my plan to transition off of it as well. Methotrexate, uh, one of the main things that we think about side effects wise in adults is the liver. In kids, we have really good um, long-term safety information and kids in general tolerate the medication from a liver standpoint. Kids often um, don't have other activities or other medications that are hepatotoxic. And so while we do continue to monitor their liver function tests throughout the course of their treatment, we do not have recommendations for liver biopsies in these groups. And finally, acetretin, one of the big concerns that we have is bone health. And I just want to point out that the issues with bone problems are generally over one milligram per kilogram dosing for extended periods of time. And so tend to be more relevant for our patients with disorders of cornification. So if the patient has either failed non-biologics or um, is not a candidate for them, then we do have our on-label uses of the biologics. And this is where the field is really growing and is very exciting at this time. So a Tanercept, for instance, um, we have great safety data down to at least age four, and it's a really easy medication to use. It's a once weekly injection, and it's available both in pre-filled syringes and a dosing vial. <clears throat> so you can certainly tailor it um, to your dosing treatments very specifically for the patient. Adalimumab as well, although off-label in the US has a dosing vial again and good safety data in younger kids. And so I consider these when I really need to use weight-based dosing. Used to kinemab, um, we have dosing guidelines over 60 kilos that aligns with our adult doses and very nice guidelines in terms of our smaller kids as well, with again, good safety data and approvals from 12 and up. And I want you to remember that infliximab, which is highlighted in the guidelines as although it is off label, is still a very useful medication because of rapid onset. So we do reserve this for kids or use it for kids with severe recalcitrant disease and possibly severe or life-threatening consequences of their psoriasis. So now we can go back to our case and decide how we might want to treat Melissa. Great. And Lara, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for all that useful information. Um, so let's go back to Melissa. Um, let's remember that she is obese with a BMI of 31. Importantly, that she's having difficulties in school um, she does have asthma and she's presenting because she, her disease is progressing and it's significantly impacting her quality of life at this point. So we'll go back to the audience again. And I'm going to ask you now, how would you change your treatment for Melissa? Okay, let's look at these results. Uh, a lot of changes post, uh, post uh, test. So uh, for oral agent, it, it's sort of went down, I think people got more specific, and uh, a lot went from um, from uh, low prevalence of methotrexate to a high uh, recommendation for methotrexate. Uh, and we saw some increase uh, in item four, uh, choosing an IL anti-23 uh, IL-12, that would be used to kinumab. Uh, and for number five in IL-17, there was a reduction, uh, maybe because it's not approved uh, so far. Um, and uh, the interesting uh, results we see so far. So, you know, Lara is an expert pediatric dermatologist. Uh, how do you interpret this data and how would you have managed this case? So I think it's a very interesting data and particularly with the increase here in the use of methotrexate. So I think one of the considerations that we have to remember is that Melissa was on methotrexate. However, we have very little information on why she was taking off of that medication. So if it was, for instance, that she was tolerating medication fine, but she was having loss of efficacy or had no efficacy, then we really need to understand what her dose was. Because if she was on relatively low dose and she is a larger kid, then maybe it's a reason reasonable choice, and we were just underdosing her. And I think that would be a reasonable option. I also wonder if some of the, um, the increase in methotrexate might be a consideration of adding methotrexate to her already uh, routine that she's using a TNF-alpha inhibitor at this time. 
at this time. Um, I think a consideration in my clinic would certainly be what is approved because what we have um, accessible in pediatrics is just going to be very different. So it, the adult kids or sorry, than the adults. And But over the next few years, and maybe even a few months, I think this will change. And so um, we do have some good information, early information about the use of IL-17s in uh, adult, excuse me, in adult patients. We certainly have those approved, but in our pediatric patients, that information is emerging. And I would anticipate some ability to use those medications more readily. But if we have a patient here that is really, she's being bullied, she's having problems in school, her school performance is decreased, I think that would be something we'd think about because of the rapidity on onset. However, it may take us months to get, and so we have to look at something that's a little bit more easily accessible. And there we would potentially look at the TNF alpha inhibitors, would require a switch in her case because she's not having good efficacy currently, or considering um, kinemab, which is approved for ages 12 and up. Yeah, it's, it's a great uh, summary of, of what's going on there. And I did find it interesting that there was uh, seemed to be a reluctance of use of uh, TNF inhibitors uh, in this patient. Uh, and they are approved for pediatric patients. They're well tolerated in that patient population. Uh, they've been around for two decades. That's also very reassuring information for parents to hear about. Uh, you know, we're almost at the end of our time. Uh, Annalisa, uh, as a general dermatologist uh, on the front lines, what would be your first drug to go to uh, for this case for Melissa, the 12-year-old girl uh, who's dealing with a lot of stigma uh, and bullying related to her psoriasis? How would you treat her? What would be your first drug? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think Lara had brought up the fact that cyclosporin is actually a very quick medication. Um, and it's, it's nice as a bridge. Uh, and I think, you know, again, oftentimes with, with the, um, the insurances that my patient population have to deal with, they have to jump through those hoops, um, in order to get something like ustekinumab. Um, so it's reasonable to think about doing a very short burst of cyclosporin in her to get her under control. Um, and then using that again as leverage for the insurance companies to bridge her to something like ustekinumab. Yes, yeah, so it's a practical real world device. Uh, it sounds like a lot of thinking is I, I need to use drug A. I don't necessarily want to use it, but I need to use it to get to the drug that I really want to get to. Well, right. I want to thank Annalisa and Lara for a great discussion. I want to briefly summarize our key takeaways from today's uh, our today's CME program, our SMART goals, which are to, in accordance with the joint AAD MPF guidelines, we recommend that you individualize treatment with biologics for moderate severe psoriasis, tailoring the patient's needs and circumstances, evaluate and appropriately treat patients with psoriasis for comorbidities, and assess disease severity, manage comorbidities and evaluate safety and effectiveness of therapy in children with psoriasis. I'd like to remind our audience again to visit the Dermatology Hub at cmeoutfitters.com, a comprehensive list of clinical resources and additional educational activities for both providers and patients. We are getting questions. We have over 500 uh, participants in today's uh, learning activities. So we're delighted for that. We have a lot of questions uh, that are coming in. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, we have a lot of excellent questions that have come in, um, and uh, we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. So uh, first one I want to sort of uh, give towards Lara. Uh, th this is a combined question about uh, pediatric uh, uh, dermatology and psoriasis. Uh, one is sort of, you know, what's the youngest age that it comes on in these patients? Uh, is it more common in, in females and males? Uh, I will answer that part epidemiologically. In fact, it's true that for, uh, for pediatric psoriasis, uh, the prevalence rises faster in girls than in boys, but they catch up in, in late adolescence. Um, so, so Lara, you know, how young uh, do you entertain the diagnosis of psoriasis in your patients? Uh, and then how do you decide uh, when you're going to jump to a systemic agent? An excellent question, and you know, I think we all appreciate that psoriasis is really an equal opportunity disease. Uh, there is infantile psoriasis. So very commonly, one of the areas that we see it in infants will be in the diaper area, and probably related to the Kebner phenomenon. However, in my experience, most of our pediatric patients that are in that young age group and in the infantile period actually do respond to topical therapy quite well. However, there are both some genetic forms of psoriasis, um, specifically some pustular psoriasis variants uh, with inflammatory disease, as well as some other kind of genetic forms that may have very young onset and severe disease. 
And this tends to be the same kind of treatment uh, decisions as I would make an older patient is really how severe is the disease? How is it affecting them? And, you know, there's a lot of medications that we feel very comfortable with, even in our youngest kids past the topical therapy. So we initiate it when we need it. And is there a differential diagnosis or do you biopsy these children or is it still a clinical diagnosis? Uh, so, you know, in um, pediatric uh, dermatology in general, you know, we always think about um, the, the biopsies and sort of the difficulty. If you need to biopsy a patient to certainly feel comfortable that you have the right um, diagnosis and starting a medication, then by all means, um, it is very reasonable to do. Um, the other thing I think is a little bit challenging is that we know that um, sort of eczematous eruptions and psoriatic eruptions in children have a little bit more of an overlap than they do in, uh, in adults. And however, just, you know, at the first line of treatment with topical therapy, we're lucky to be in that category that our first step of management would be all the same. And so one of the things that I always say is that really, if you're going to more invasive procedures, such as a biopsy, just really think how it's going to change your management before putting a child through that. So if it will change your management to verify, absolutely something I would do. Yeah, I think that's a really key point there. Only biopsy if you know it's going to change your management in some way. So this is a great question. Uh, who should own comorbidity screening, the dermatologist or the primary care doc? Uh, and let me go to Annalisa for that. Uh, you know, she, Annalisa is a very busy uh, uh, dermatology practice, seeing many patients in a session. Uh, how do you think about this problem? Well, that's, I think it's a great question, especially because this is something that I discuss with my residents almost daily. Um, especially because I believe that a lot of our patients are, um, they, they kind of fall through the cracks a little bit when it comes to things like this. Uh, I think a lot of them don't, like I had mentioned, they don't have um, good health insurance. So they tend to not see a primary care doctor. Um, and if they have a primary care doctor, oftentimes they're, they're just not getting these types of um, screenings. So it's, I think it's incumbent upon us as dermatologists to ensure that if they are not getting screened, that it does fall on us. And I think Joel, you outlined um, some really good, just baseline things that we can do um, that really wouldn't take that long in the clinic um, in terms of just questions, history, and some simple lab tests if they haven't been done already. Yeah, I think that's, that's the way I sort of think about it. And I think the way my colleagues uh, who are listening to us should think about it is that uh, this is a prevalent problem in this patient population. And so you have to have a plan of how you're going to manage it. And so your plan may be to educate and refer back to the primary doctor. Uh, your plan may be to take on some of this yourself when they don't have a primary care doctor. Uh, your plan may be to have a colleague who specifically wants to see these patients. So at Penn, uh, we have a a, uh, a lipid cardiovascular prevention clinic, and they love seeing patients with psoriasis. Uh, and so uh, a lot of my patients will go see our, our cardiovascular prevention clinic and get some specialized uh, evaluation. They'll often get coronary CT scans because we know the prognostic models are really built for otherwise healthy people, not for people with inflammatory disease like psoriasis, which could be misleading in terms of what their real risk is going to be. Um, you know, Laura, there's a couple of questions about the drug of Premolast, uh, which we use in adults. You know, Premolast uh, is a very popular therapy amongst adults. It's a pill. Uh, it's taken twice daily. It's pretty well tolerated, although there's some GI side effects, uh, a low risk of infection, uh, and a low risk of depression, uh, and um, but doesn't have the, mo the best efficacy. If we give it to, say, 10 patients, about three out of 10 have a, have a very good response in the skin. Uh, what's your viewpoint, uh, Lara, of uh, a premolast for pediatric psoriasis? So one of the challenges right now with a premolest is that it is only available as a pill. And so again, you're just going to take a whole bunch of patients off the table there that simply cannot uh, use it in that preparation. However, a premolest is currently in trials, in um, phase three clinical trials for the use in pediatric psoriasis. And so I think that um, I'm very excited about having that as an agent. But it's important to note, you said that in your efficacy data in adults, it's important to remember in pediatric patients, the efficacy and, and safety as well could be different. And so I'm looking forward to the results of that to really see what can, is going to be the performance of the drug, because it's nice, again, like I mentioned with the acetretin, to have an option that is not as immunosuppressive um, when we're considering things like vaccines and then all of the various things that kids are exposed to at school every day.
Thank you, Lara, for that insight. So we're getting a lot of questions about uh, about patients asking about whether they should stay on their biologic, especially TNFs, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so, yeah, we should take some time to address that as a panel. So uh, I, I think if you take a step back, we have to recognize that we really have limited data of the three classes of drugs we have on the likelihood of, of aggravating or increasing your risk of developing COVID-19 or having worse outcomes. As I presented earlier in the program, we know that some of the cytokines that are upregulated and people who have bad COVID-19 infections would actually be reduced to TNF, IL-17, uh, IL-12. And so that might be an argument that the biologics may have some benefit to play. Uh, that's purely speculative and is a hypothesis at this point in time, but at least one biologic in IL-6 is being studied for the quote-unquote cytokine storm. Uh, we do know, on the other hand, that these therapies do make you more prone to infections. Uh, even the IL-17s, which are uh, such well-tolerated drugs, and the IL-23s, who are also very well-tolerated, you know, when you're looking at prescribing information, they have slightly higher risks of infections, particularly upper respiratory tract infections, compared to the placebo group over a short period of time, 12 weeks or so. Uh, these differences, these absolute differences are pretty small, one to two percent difference between the two groups, um, but they're not, they're not zero. And so I think we have to be humble with what we know uh, and be individual in how we think about it. So I'll give you a couple of examples from my practice, an older patient, 70 years old, uh, history of coronary disease, um, and his initial uh, treatment was with a biologic, a 23 in this case, and his baseline severity was not bad. Uh, he never had severe disease. He was controlled with phototherapy on and off for years or topicals, eventually got tired of that and wanted to try a biologic. He's someone who I'm not worried about stopping his biologic, running out of treatment options, and him flaring, right? different patient might be a younger patient who's been through three or four different biologics, uh, has, you know, terrible psoriasis that tends to flare in their skin, their joints when they come off biologics, otherwise healthy. This is the kind of person where I think we could feel pretty comfortable saying you should stay on your biologic. Uh, but for many of our patients, we could say you, you, you can wait a little bit, you know, if you're concerned about this, wait a little bit. And when your next shot is due, if your skin is still clear, we, we could potentially push it back a little bit. And if your skin starts coming back, we could address it at that point in time. And Elisa, what's your perspective on this topic? Yeah, so I, I think that um, it, it absolutely has to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think you need to inquire with the patients how their level of concern of contracting um, SARS-CoV-2 versus their significant concerns about flaring off medication. Um, and different people are going to feel different ways about it. And I think that um, if there is a compelling reason to take someone off, such as they are a healthcare worker and they are going to be in the ER um, and they're going to have a higher risk of exposure, then you need to think about that as well. Um, I think one other thing that you had brought up about one of your patients, the older gentleman um, who already has cardiovascular disease, is that um, a lot of the complications of uh, resulting in death from COVID um, obviously the first are pulmonary, but there are also a lot of cardiovascular complications uh, resulting in death. So I think that uh, with a patient with an underlying um, significant cardiovascular profile, um, that does need to be brought into the consideration as well. Yeah, and, and certainly we're going to learn a lot more as unfortunately more and more people are affected and maybe we'll get some data out to really help guide our uh, decision makings, but it's still very much a, a risk benefit uh, type consideration. Uh, here's a question about the impact of exercise and diet on the impact of psoriasis out outcomes, especially in pediatrics. Uh, as Lara's uh, starting to think about this, I'll just say in the adult population, there are some decently well done clinical trials, uh, people randomized to weight loss versus uh, their regular uh, uh, recommendations. And when you lose weight, the psoriasis is easier to treat, uh, more likely to clear with uh, concomitant therapy. Uh, the effects are kind of modest, but certainly good for the person's overall health. There's no specific diet you need to follow. It's not like you need a gluten-free diet to get these outcomes, uh, but just weight loss in general for people who are obese uh, is something I generally recommend, and it often encourages the patients to know that their skin may be easier to control. Uh, now, Lara, what about in the, uh, in the pediatric and adolescent population? Uh, what's your opinion on diet and exercise in relationship to psoriasis activity? 
So I absolutely agree with everything that you said in my experience is uh, that in addition to potentially getting better control of the disease and better control of potentially disease trajectory, remember a lot of our medications are weight-based as well. And so we really don't know ideal body weight sometimes and how that interplays in with our kids that um, have a higher body fat percentage. But the other thing that I think is really important in pediatrics is that getting to a healthy weight in addition to setting up for long-term health also reduces some of the other quality of life or the other stig stigmatization that happens in kids. So if you have a kid with severe psoriasis and obesity, um, it really it kind of adds to a lot of the mental health problems. And so it's just another angle to think about uh, to recommend interventions. And I have to say, there's a lot of really great programs in pediatrics, and sometimes it is at some of the larger institutions, but I would encourage you to find out what the resources are in your area. So for instance, um, in the places that I've worked, there are these, what do we call heart health programs, that are comprehensive behavior change programs that look at diet and exercise and general kind of good health habits in pediatric, and they're very pediatric focused. And so I'm more likely in a patient with um, psoriasis that has obesity to think about a referral to one of these programs earlier on. Yeah, I think really we want to think about these kids is it's an opportunity to try and shift their trajectory in life, right? So they now have a warning flag early on that they have an inflammatory disease. Their risk of having cardiovascular disease in the next 10, 20, 30 years is close to zero, right? Uh, but you think about their 40s, their 50s, or 60s, right. and it's, it's a visible thing to say, you know, this is a, an, an extra uh, uh, encouragement for us to think about how we get you into a, a healthier lifestyle and, and, and help have you be healthier uh, over the long term. And joint um, wear and tear well, as well as something to think about. There. Yep. Uh, we're getting towards the end of our program. We have a question about uh, any tips on moving to telehealth. So at Penn Dermatology, we're sort of uh, converting rapidly to telehealth. Uh, I did all my visits via telemedicine this week, so it's a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, one is you want to document, 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 because uh, you know payers will vary on the level of which they're willing to uh, cover these services uh, during this time. We should document that uh, you know telemedicine due to COVID-19. Uh, document the time you spent reviewing the chart. Uh, speaking with the patient, uh, as well as your findings from reviewing any photographs or video images that you're using. Uh, in my own practice now, I mainly take care of people with psoriasis. I'm finding it's taking a good 20 to 20 minutes to 30 minutes a patient to go into the chart, get them on the phone, do the visit, close out my note and send it to them so they have their instructions. So as you're starting this, I would plan to do uh, one patient every 30 minutes until you get more comfortable with it. Uh, Annalise, I see you shaking your head. Your, your, your comments on this? Yeah, so uh, our entire practice is moving as quickly as we can to all telehealth visits. And I think um, at the outset, it was really important to make the note that the goal here is Yes, we will have to see patients in the office because they will need biopsies. There are going to be abscesses that need drainage, but we need to keep these people out of the ERs um, because if you have someone with a significant issue and, they, and you don't see them, then they're going to end up in the ER. Um, but yeah, so most of our non-urgent visits have all uh, switched to telehealth, and I'm actually finding it very um, comprehensive, uh, and, and, and it's, it's working so far this week anyway for for the patients as well yeah well i think uh i know my patients really appreciate during these uncertain times uh, having the doctors they could go to uh were a source of comfort and information that they need and reassurance uh, i think it makes a big difference uh to be available through telemedicine during these times and so we're, we're seeing a lot of patients uh in that way uh one uh, final question that came through is uh, would you take plaquenil and azithromycin if you got seriously ill with covid19 uh, and i would say uh, during these really uncertain times what we need is certainty. We need data and science to make rigorous and logical decisions. Uh, and so I would certainly take those if I was in a clinical trial and randomize to it. Uh, but outside of a clinical trial, uh, I think these things should be studied uh, in a more rigorous setting so we know if they really help or not help our patients. Uh, so with there, I want to apologize to our audience. We got way more questions than we possibly could have taken during a short period of time. Uh, but I really want to thank you for your attention and your and your engagement. Uh, all these questions we received really shows uh, that people are engaged with this program, uh, really getting their, their minds thinking around these complicated issues. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, my uh, fellow faculty members, uh, Annalisa and Larry, did a terrific job for us today. And uh, thank you all again for joining us in this See Me Outfitters program. Thank you. Thank you.